Welcome to the London Luminaries Lecture Series. It's lovely to have you here and it's lovely to be with 12 different heritage organisations celebrating our local heritage. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm from Marble Hill and I'll be the host for this evening. So it is with great delight that I get the opportunity to introduce you to our chair for this evening. She's a lecturer, a broadcaster and a historian and also a trustee of Pope's Grotto. It's Professor Judith Hawley. Thank you, Rachel, for that introduction. And thank you, those of you who are watching us live. A special thanks to those of you who are watching um, more than one talk in this series. It's really nice to build this relationship with the audience. I want to begin by thanking those people you can't see, especially to Chris, uh, Robert, Angela and Ricky and all those who've made this series possible. It's uh, the third in our series of luminaries talks. We've done previous series on Twickenham luminaries and London luminaries. Just want to say um, uh, very briefly why we have this series. We live in a, a very special part of the world. There's a stretch of the Thames from Richmond to Hampton Court, which has been the home of poets, painters, aristocrats, writers, wealthy landowners, and especially during the 18th century, where London was the heart of an expanding empire. And this area of the Thames is within sort of commuting distance, within a day's boat journey of the centre of London. So it attracted a lot of people. These people networked, learnt from each other, and vied with each other to build beautiful villas on the banks of the Thames, many of which still survive. Now, the site we're going to be focusing on today is the wonderful Ham House. And our speaker I'm really delighted to introduce is Dr. Hannah Maudsley. She is the property curator at the National Trust's Ham House and Garden. And it's a 17th century uh, Jacobean mansion on the banks of the River Thames near Richmond. Ham has one of the most important collections in the National Trust with an extraordinary array of art, furniture, and interior decoration. Hannah is an expert speaker, her PhD undertaken with the Imperial War Museum and Queen Mary University of London, considered the politics of commemoration. Thank you very much, Judith. I started my role at Ham House and Garden a couple of years ago, and since then I've really enjoyed starting to get to know the collection and the stories and the histories of this place. And I just wanted to express my gratitude to my colleagues, um, both staff and volunteers who have taken me under their wing and shared with me their passion and their knowledge inspired me to uh, explore. And one element I was particularly inspired to explore was the history relating to Wilbraham, sixth Earl of Dysart, and his role as a collector and patron of the arts. Wilbraham was Earl of Dysart and owner of Ham House between 1799 and 1821. And this isn't actually a period that gets talked about that much at Ham, um, because Ham is such a rare survival of 17th century style and taste. We love to celebrate that, as you might imagine. However, the survival of 17th century Ham owes lots to the passion and foresight of sympathetic family members over the centuries who sought to repair and preserve, as well as improve what we see today. If you're unfamiliar with this area of the UK, this is where Ham lies. So you can see on the uh, UK map on the left, the star where we are just west of London um, and the star on the larger map where Ham sits on the River Thames. So just, just southwest of London, so a lovely area. It's located in an area with many other historic sites nearby. And in fact, you can see a couple of the other sites that are part of Luminary series as well, Marble Hill and Pope's Grotto. When you visit today, and if you haven't visited before, this is Ham House, you're transported back to the late 17th century when Elizabeth Tolmash, Duchess of Lauderdale, and her second husband, John Maitland, the Duke, created a lavish home and garden in the style of the time. Inside the house, this included sumptuous interior decoration, art and furniture, while also preserving some of the earlier 17th century decoration commissioned by Elizabeth's father, William Murray. Elizabeth was herself an enthusiastic collector and patron of the arts, and surviving personal financial accounts written by the Duchess in the 1670s and 1680s include payments to well-known upholsterers, cabinet makers, embroiderers and frame makers. But as I've just mentioned, all of this effort would have been lost were it not for the sympathetic efforts of later family members. 
Called Romantic Antiquarians by some modern commentators, these descendants treasured the quality of the 17th century interiors, art and furniture, as well as the structure of the house itself. Through these individuals, Ham avoided much of the modernization and remodeling that some historic houses underwent over the intervening centuries. One such romantic antiquarian, and the focus of today's talk was Wilbraham Tolmash. He was the sixth Earl of Dysart and Elizabeth's great-great-grandson. This is him as a boy playing a racket sport that might look quite familiar to you. It was called Battledore and Shuttlecock. It's a precursor to badminton. You can see the shuttlecock with feathers in his hand there. Rather than replace, he repaired, restored and enhanced the 17th century legacy at Ham during his 22-year tenure, Earl of Dysart, from 1799 to 1821. He had been born in 1739, and as the second son, he wouldn't have expected to inherit. But when his brother Lionel, the fifth Earl, died childless, he inherited Ham House and other family properties in 1799. Now, the fifth Earl's tenure had been a time of retrenchment and reclusion, and he'd actually gone so far as to demolish two other family properties, Harrington Hall in Northamptonshire and Woodhay Hall in Cheshire, which were both important and large houses to resolve some of the cash flow problems. And the fifth Earl generally remained retreated from the world and didn't make that many notable changes at Ham during his time as Earl. And the decline of Ham House under the fifth Earl did not escape the notice of the social commentators of a time. For example, in 1770, Horace Walpole, who was the prolific letter writer and uncle to the fifth Earl's uh, first wife, scathingly described Ham thus, the furniture is so magnificently ancient, dreary and decayed, to every step one's spirits sink, and all my passion for antiquity could not keep them up. In this state of pomp and tatters, my nephew intends it shall remain. Walpole particularly bemoaned the isolation of the house from the nearby River Thames, saying that the fifth earl seems to be as much afraid of water as a cat, for though you might enjoy the Thames from every window of three sides of the house, you would tumble into it before you would guess it was there. Think of such a palace commanding all the reach of Richmond and Twickenham with a domain from the foot of Richmond Hill to Kingston Bridge and then imagine it being wild, dismal and prospectless. And it was clearly a bit of an ongoing bugbear for Walpole, um, shown by another letter written in 1779 in which he expressed his delight that storms had blown down 35 elm trees at Ham and he hoped that might actually improve the view between the river and the house. In 1799, the fifth Earl died, aged 65, and was succeeded by his brother, Wilbraham. The approach of Wilbraham and his wife, Anna Maria, to Ham and its collection was very different from his predecessor. Despite being a second son and not initially expecting to inherit, Wilbraham clearly had an inkling in later years that he might inherit when his brother's two marriages remained childless. The speed with which he set about preserving and improving Ham House on his succession suggests that he had considered the improvements that he would make if he were Earl to Ham for some time. He quickly purchased land towards Kingston in the south, considerably expanding the Ham estate. And another of his early actions reflected similar sentiments to those of Horace Walpole, where he opened up the front of the Ham estate to the river. This rather lovely watercolour depicts the six Earl and his wife holding a party for their tenantry on the meadow that still sits between the house and the river and I think it really illustrates the difference between Wilbraham and his brother's approaches in both attitude as well as action. As you can see the Earl and his wife are gregarious and sociable. I think that is them in the middle just slightly to the right there. The wall that had previously surrounded the front courtyard and enclosed the space fully was opened up, creating views both to and from the River Thames. And between the house and the river, a ha-ha was installed to form a subtle barrier, one that didn't interrupt the view. So you can see the ha-ha just above the level of the seated guests. Wilbraham also invested in the external decoration of Ham. You can see in this slide the finials and also the statue in the front there. Today, you can see the same statuary at Ham House. The finials are in the form of pineapples, a symbol of hospitality and wealth at the time, another indication in, in my head of Wilbraham's gregarious and outward-facing nature in contrast to his brother. 
The reclining statue at the front of Ham House is the River God, a representation of Father Thames, and also a copy of the bronze version you can still see at Somerset House in London that was created by sculptor John Bacon in the late 1780s. And this is the period when British naval power was really on the rise. And so the Thames, which had always been the lifeblood of the city of London, became a broader symbol for British strength and trade and superiority. And although this statue looks like it might be made of stone, it's actually made of code stone, which is a fired ceramic stone. And it was a product created by Eleanor Code, who ran a manufactory on the riverside in Lambeth, London in the late 18th and early 19th century. The product was extremely hard wearing and allowed incredible detail to be created, making it ideal for architectural decoration. And this is the manufactory at Lambeth. And you'll see on the left there a familiar looking statue that we just saw in real life. And Mrs. Code was known as Mrs. Code, um, not because she was married, but it was an honorific due to her formidable reputation as a businesswoman. And her product attracted the patronage of not only the sixth Earl of Dysart, but also many other wealthy customers. And numerous examples of code stone survive, both showing how hard wearing a product it was, but also demonstrating how well her product was received by the fashionable and wealthy of the time. Examples can still be seen at high profile sites, including St. George's Chapel, Windsor, the Royal Naval Hospital in Greenwich and Buckingham Palace. One of my favorite things is the fact that you could pick what you wanted from the catalogue, a sort of Argos catalogue of its time. You can see from this zoom in that the item one, page one, a river god with an urn through which a stream of water may be carried. And you could purchase that for the princely sum of £105, which is about £9,000 in today's money. And you could also buy a, uh, a shell to a company if you want for an extra £21. So it depends how flash you were feeling. Wilbraham and Anna Maria also turned their attention inside the house. They had furniture repaired and chairs recovered, preserving the extraordinary 17th century craftsmanship collected by their forebears. But they didn't just preserve, they also collected high quality art and furniture of their own time and patronized the great names of the day, including Joshua Reynolds and John Constable. Wilbraham and Anna Maria had been patrons of Joshua Reynolds long before Wilbraham inherited Ham. Reynolds was commissioned to paint Anna Maria soon after her marriage to Wilbraham in 1773, creating this painting which now hangs at Kenwood House in North London, depicting Anna Maria as Miranda from Shakespeare's The Tempest. Wilbraham's sisters were also painted by Reynolds and he bought various other paintings as well. John Constable was introduced to Wilbraham in 1807 by a solicitor and was commissioned to copy some of Wilbraham's family pictures. One such copy was this of the Reynolds of Anna Maria, and you can see the similarities between the Reynolds on the left and the Constable copy here on the right. The Constable currently hangs in the Great Hall at Ham House, so you can see it in person. Constable was known to Sir John Beaumont, who was one of the foremost experts on art at the time and an individual who was instrumental in founding the National Gallery. And accounts show how Constable and Beaumont visited Ham to see Wilbraham's collection, which really underlines its importance to the serious collectors of that day. Not only collecting, but Wilbraham was himself a keen artist and both painted and drew. In the Gentleman's Magazine of 1821, it noted that his proficiency in drawing, painting and the fine arts was considerable. Wilbraham and Anna Maria also collected new furniture, including this glorious breakfront commode, which is a similar style to one you can see at the Palace of Versailles. It has the most amazing marquetry on it, including various musical instruments and also sheet music on the top, which I'm determined to try and transcribe and see if I can deploy my questionable piano skills to see what that sounds like. Also a sofa table style exquisite piano forte by John Broadwood on the right hand side there. Again, with beautiful uh, marquetry, really lovely. Sadly, Wilbraham and Anna Maria only had five years together at Ham, as she died at Ham in 1804. And Wilbraham was absolutely devastated and he felt spent far less time at Ham after her death. He stayed at his other properties all with family and he found solace in his painting and drawing. Queen Charlotte, wife of King George III, recorded in a letter how the loss of Anna Maria had affected both Wilbraham and Ham House, saying, Upon the whole, the place remaining in the old style is beautiful and magnificent, both within and without, but truly melancholy. My Lord is very little there since the death of his lady, for whom he had the greatest regard and attention. Despite this melancholic air, Queen Charlotte had visited Ham before, 
and noted the positive changes that had been brought about to the house and collection by Wilbraham and Anna Maria. She said, the house is much altered since I saw it by repairing. And though the old furniture still remains, it is now kept so clean that even under the tattered state of hangings and chairs, one must admire the good taste of our forefathers and their magnificence. And she mentioned in another letter, the parquet floors have been taken up with great care, cleaned and relayed. And in order to preserve them, the present Lord has put carpets over them, but of course not laid down. Shocking, what a thought. <laughs> Wilbraham died in 1821, aged 82, and since he was also childless and his naval officer brothers had drowned at sea, the various estates were split and Ham was inherited by his sister, Louisa Manners Tolmash. She became seventh Countess of Dysart in her own right. Louisa also had a, a romantic streak. In 1765, she had eloped from Ham House with John Manners, who was an Ill illegitimate grandson of the Duke of Rutland through a gate in the garden wall. And legend has it that Louisa threw the key back over the wall so that she couldn't change her mind once she'd made that move. Louisa continued the artistic patronage fostered at Ham by her brother. This picture was painted by a constable in 1823, which was two years after Louisa succeeded Wilbraham, and was a copy of a John Hopner original painted in 1805, which hangs in the Museum of Art and History in Geneva. Constable was a regular visitor to Ham in the 1820s and 30s when Louisa was in charge and appears to have developed a really close friendship. He wrote how they walked arm in arm in the garden and fields and how he had enjoyed a nice dish of tea with the Countess. In another account, he described an invitation to a lavish meal after which he walked about the grounds and plucked as much fruit as I wanted, peaches and all sorts. And he even took his children with him on some occasions. In an account from 1829, he described how he had passed a day or two with my children at Ham House. The Countess of Dysart was very kind and pleased with my children, three of whom were with me. Constable clearly valued the chance to see Ham House. He said in 1834 that, I'm going to Ham House tomorrow. We must not fail of seeing it together. I expect always to meet Charles II or the Duke of Marlborough or Addison in every room I wander in. It has the art in portraiture of all the ages on its walls. We'd love to welcome you to Ham House and Garden soon if you want to take Constable at his word, but it's unmissable. For now, I want to thank you so much for listening to this talk. There's some further reading uh, here if you are interested. And just a note to mention, we're always delighted to hear if people want to get more involved. So if you're interested in volunteering, please do get in touch. Thank you so much, Hannah. We do have uh, a lot of other talks coming up. Tomorrow we have Chiswick House and Gardens. Next week we have a wonderful talk about Soane at Pittshanger and another one uh, about Alexander Pope. We also have another season coming up in January and February. And if you've missed anything from the previous series, the talks will all be available on YouTube. And finally, before I, I thank um, Hannah and open it open to questions, I want to encourage you, if you want to support the work of Ham House and Garden further financially, please text HAM to 70525. I do like the idea of being able to text HAM to someone or, or indeed to, to anything. Thank you so much, Hannah, for that, that fascinating talk. It was so interesting to hear about those relationships between, in a way, the producers and the, and the consumers of art. It was, it was fascinating. Thank you so much.